Well, good morning. I just want to welcome you here to our third week of exploring the class Fighting for Faith in Suffering. And we're all familiar with times where we are going through the valley, where we are suffering, sometimes for the cause of Christ, sometimes because we have problems and issues that have come into our life. Uh, we feel sometimes like we are going through life, everything is great, and then life has a way of throwing us a curveball. And in that, we just don't know exactly what to do or, or how to turn. And I pray that even as believers in Christ, we have something that the lost and pagan world does not have. We have all the resources of heaven at our disposal. And so even when we go through the trials, the tribulations, the losses of life, uh, the painful times of life, uh, the troubling times of life, the suffering times of life, we can contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. We can rely upon our faith and the power and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love the promises of the Word, of, of God's Word to us. Uh, the promises that God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The fact that the Lord is close to those who are broken hearted. We looked at that passage some last week. That our Lord will never, ever leave us alone. That he will never, ever uh, leave us to despair. Uh, now we might uh, respond very naturally to that. Uh, I would just remind you, we looked at this when I was teaching the class on... Um, on systematic theology that uh, we do have an enemy that enemy has a name he is called the devil uh, he is the father of all lies and sometimes when we go through the painful times of life and the suffering times of life uh, the devil wants to come around and and allow us to to hear uh, false accusations oh if you were a real believer and God really loved you you wouldn't be suffering like this uh, this uh, issue would not have befallen you if you truly were faithful to the Lord. And I've seen some of God's greatest and, and most uh, wonderful saints, most faithful believers in Christ, uh, go through very painful and very difficult times in life. Not because the Lord did not love them, but because the Lord did love them and the Lord was trying to do some incredible things in their life. And instead of giving up in despair, instead of wallowing around in grief, instead of giving up on life, uh, they walked by faith and they saw God do some incredible and wonderful things in their hearts and in their lives. And so I pray that this class uh, today will be uh, very meaningful and very helpful to you. As today, uh, the, the, the subtitle of the class today is simply The Empathy of a Suffering God. Now, that might uh, be a title that may cause you some, uh, some concern. Uh, does our God really uh, empathize with us? But uh, we're talking about the empathy of a suffering God, that our God is one who empathizes with us. He sympathizes with us. Uh, he is a God who suffers just like we did because our Lord came in the flesh, fully man, yet fully God. And so we'll be looking some at this uh, uh, today. But uh, what do we do when something happens and we don't really understand, uh, which is the reason that we ask why? Uh, one of the first things that we can do to ourselves when the troubling times of life come, when the losses come, when the pain and the suffering come, when the trials and tribulations come, uh, is that we can ask that question, why am I facing this situation? And uh, what's going on in my life? And we can face this situation with spiritual, biblical thought, or uh, we can revert sometimes, and I think this is very natural to all of us, uh, perhaps consciously or unconsciously, to a more natural, rational way of thinking. Uh, let me uh, clarify the difference between rational and spiritual thoughts as they are being used. Uh, to do this, I want to uh, quote from uh, a, uh, a fellow by the name of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a medically trained doctor and a pastor at London's uh, Westminster Chapel. Uh, 
in the middle of the last century, and he said this. He said, while I draw a distinction between rational thinking and spiritual thinking, I am not for a moment suggesting that spiritual thinking is irrational. The only difference between them is that rational thinking is on ground level only. Spiritual thinking is equally rational, but it takes in a higher level as well as the lower level. It takes in all the facts instead of merely some of them. And I think that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, when I was sitting in my uh, pastor's study in the last church where I was pastoring and the phone call came and it was my uh, doctor friend who uh, said, Wes, we've done all the testing, we've done all the scans and I hate to tell you, but you have cancer and it's a malignant cancer and, and we, need to, um, we need to do something very quickly about that. Uh, you know, my first thoughts were, man, it was just like hitting me in the gut. Uh, you know, I went into denial. I told my doctor friend, I said, Greg, you've picked up the wrong uh, chart. You've picked up somebody else's chart. You've gotten somebody else's test. And he said, no, Wes, I've gotten yours, and, and this is what we're dealing with. And then I had to go home and tell my wife and, and uh, tell my boys about what uh, was happening with me. And uh, it brings about a lot of emotions. But I can tell you, while facing all the the rational and, and the real emotions and, and all of the questions that come when you receive a diagnosis of that uh, nature, immediately came the promises of God. And uh, I can't tell you other than just the fact that the peace that surpasses all understanding took over. And uh, it, was, it was an incredible experience. And I came out of that experience uh, and really even going into that experience saying, you know, Lord, I wouldn't have chosen this, but I'm thankful that I get to, to grow in my faith. I'm thankful that I get to experience uh, your love and your grace on a deeper level, on a level that I would have never experienced apart from this experience. And so it's, it's a way in which we look at these things. We, we have that mixture of the, of the rational thought of uh, even spiritual attack when Satan wants to come in and try to uh, tell us that we're somewhat less of a believer in Christ when we face these times uh, when we're walking through the valley. But yet, we're also confronted with the realities of what we know about God and about, his, and about His Word. And I would just simply say this to you parenthetically. The best time to prepare for walking through the valley is, uh, is now. To understand God's Word, to, to memorize God's Word, to, to study God's Word, to know God, to know those promises that He gives you, so when the down times come, and they will if they haven't already, uh, when you're walking through that valley, you will know beyond any shadow of a doubt that there is a God in heaven who is still on his throne, who still loves you, and his grace is always sufficient. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And if he provides healing in this life, it's that we might continue to serve him and to witness to him and to use our suffering as a platform uh, to proclaim the glorious uh, graces of a loving God. And if he decides to heal us in heaven, then we rejoice to be absent from this body, is to be present with him. And so we really have nothing to fear on either side of, uh, of this uh, equation. And so uh, here we are, God's grief over suffering, the empathy of a suffering God. Think about it. Of all the gods worshipped in this world, only one is a God who has suffered. That is, at the same time, the uh, grand absurdity and all of the grand wonder of the Christian faith, we serve a God who has suffered. He has walked the road. Uh, you right, might remember that even when Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, how he prayed and how he suffered and how he sweat uh, drops of blood, uh, an incredible grief, an incredible suffering, even having his body uh, beaten and his uh, back and, and his body whipped and how he suffered. And even as he hung on that cross, having all of the sin of uh, 
humanity uh, heaped upon him. What incredible suffering. And yet, uh, in that, we understand that our God understands what little suffering we go through. And I love what the Apostle Paul has told us. The suffering that we go through in this life is not worth comparing to the glorious riches that we will experience when we are apart from this world, apart from this body, and when we are present with the Lord. I am grateful that we serve a God who was so honest, even in that Garden of Gethsemane, as he was sweating drops of blood, as he was facing all kinds of agony. He said, Lord, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But then he came back and he said, Nevertheless, Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done. And so he has walked the road. He understands what we are going through. Uh, he understands our suffering. Uh, I love the fact that our God lives, that he rules, that he reigns, that he has conquered death, that he has resurrected from the grave. He has ascended back to his Father in heaven. Uh, our Lord and Savior is sitting at the right hand of of God and he is interceding uh, for us uh, I find that great comfort in the fact that even this morning he's interceding for you interceding for all that are in this class interceding for myself uh, that our God knows exactly what we are going through and so um, I want us to uh, when we go through these uh, down times of life that uh, we would raise our our rational thinking uh, and move into that higher level of spiritual thinking uh, which convinces us that we can trust our Lord more and more and that's the pattern that I want us to be able uh, to follow so as we explore this topic uh, we will begin with a uh, brief look at the substance of that suffering in the person of Jesus Christ and then we'll take uh, time to unpack Hebrews chapter 4 which says that because of his suffering, uh, Christ understands us. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, that uh, gives uh, Christ's suffering as an example. And so um, the first thing I want us to see this morning in our outline is this question, how does the fact that Christ's suffering help us in our own suffering? Now that's an important question. Uh, when we look at the cross... We see uh, there at the cross where love and justice meet. It's a place where love and justice meet. Uh, I love uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 uh, that simply says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I think so many times when we suffer, uh, we are looking for answers. But also when we suffer, we need mercy and uh, we need justice. And because of Christ's death, a just God shows mercy to us. I mean, what do we deserve? We deserve death and, and, and hell. We don't deserve anything from God. But we need to recognize that God's mercy uh, to us as sinners could never come without Christ's suffering on the cross. And God's just, right? And we have sinned against him. And that means that we deserve his punishment, not his mercy. But this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us how we get mercy. That Jesus didn't simply suffer as an example or as an inspiration, though both are true. He suffered in our place. He suffered what we deserved. And so his suffering as a substitute purchases our ability, if you will, to even consider his suffering as a source of comfort and as an example. It purchases our ability to even consider the rest of uh, what we're going to be talking about in these next uh, three weeks and the remainder of this class. Because of Jesus' suffering, our own suffering can make us fit for heaven rather than simply being a down payment on hell. So most importantly, 
Uh, Jesus' suffering was for us. But beyond that, it offers us both comfort and an example, which we will turn to for the remainder of our time together this morning. Uh, consider, second of all, the comfort in God's uh, empathy. The comfort in God's empathy. Uh, let's look in um, uh, one aspect of suffering that can feel unbearable to us is the sense that we are alone. But uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 4 and verses uh, 9 and 10, I don't think I put this in your sermon notes. I'm just going to add this in. Uh, Solomon writes that two are better than one. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Now you think about what suffering is like when no one understands when no one's been through it before, no one who can help you up. I talked to a young couple today, or uh, this week, Joan and I did, uh, who had uh, lost a child. And as we have lost a child, it gave us a, a great uh, platform to have empathy with this couple and to share with this couple and, and hear this couple and listen to this couple. And, and uh, they were so grateful for the opportunity to talk with us because they said, you know, we understand that you know what we are going through because you yourselves have gone through it. And yet, no matter how alone we may feel in our suffering, when we come to the cross and when we look to the cross, we find a God who can empathize with us. Just a quick uh, primer on the English language. Sympathy is when you feel for someone. But empathy is when you know from experience what they are going through. And uh, so the amazing thing about uh, our Lord and uh, our Savior, uh, the Christian God, is that he not just sympathizes. That would be incredible, I think, in and of itself. But he empathizes us. And here's what we read in Hebrews chapter 4 uh, in verses 14 and 16. This is a great passage of Scripture. Scripture, uh, particularly when we're going through times of, 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 of hardship and, and times of, of suffering. Uh, the Scripture says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, when did he pass through the heavens? He passed through the heavens not only when he came to earth, uh, not only when he left heaven, the incarnation when he came to earth, when he was born as a helpless little babe uh, who lived uh, 33 years upon this uh, world and uh, suffered just like we do, fu fully human, yet fully God. Uh, and then he uh, was put to death on that cross. He was resurrected. He ascended back to his Father in heaven. And uh, because he has passed through uh, the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, our faith. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In his incarnation, when he became fully human, fully man, Jesus walked in our shoes. And so he is able to help us when we are suffering. Not only does he sympathize with us, but he also empathizes with us. And John Stott helps us here with, with a highly fictional image of billions of people uh, seated before God's judgment throne. And uh, John Stott writes this. He says, Some shrank back, but others objected. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? Snapped one woman who had suffered in a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beatings, torture, death. Others agreed. What did God know of weeping, of hunger, of hatred? 
God leads a sheltered life in heaven, they said. Someone from Hiroshima, born, people born deformed, others murdered, sent, uh, each sent forward a leader. They concluded that before God could judge them, he should have to endure suffering as they did, and they pronounced a sentence on God. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Let his close friends betray him. Let him face false charges. Let a prejudiced jury try him and a cowardly judge convict him. Let him be tortured. Let him be utterly alone. Then bloody and forsaken with all the sins of humanity piled upon him, let him die. The room grew silent after the sentence against God had been pronounced. No one moved, and a weight fell on each face, for suddenly all knew that God already had served his sentence. And this comes from the uh, book uh, that John Stott wrote, uh, The Cross of Christ. And so going back to the fuller passage from Hebrews chapter 4 uh, that you see in your handout, let me take um, in four pieces uh, so that we can see exactly how God's empathy in our suffering uh, brings comfort. The first thing that we see is that Jesus understands our weaknesses. So much of the difficulty of suffering comes uh, when we feel that God is asking us to do more than is humanly possible. But guess what? God became a human. He understands. That's the beauty, I think, of the incarnation. There are lots of practical applications of this, but here's one you may not have thought of. Uh, use this uh, to read the Psalms in a fresh way. As one writer has put it, virtually every Psalm is either about the Messiah or by the Messiah. And so they say things that go beyond what any human author had ever experienced. In Psalm 1, for example, uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Surely no one but Jesus epitomized that. Or in Psalm 22, words that were written for Jesus to use, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. In Psalm 22, in verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How many times, you don't need to raise your hands, but how many times have we thought those words or said those words when we have faced intense times of suffering or trial or persecution or loss? Many of the Psalms describe the suffering of Jesus. And yet, use them to walk through your own suffering as the words of the one who has walked them before. Jesus was weak, and, though the Psalm, and through the Psalms, he explores faith, even in times of weaknesses. That's why I love to, to turn to the book of Psalms when I'm facing all kinds of, of uh, hardship or, or suffering. Our loss. Uh, the Psalms bring a, a great comfort to us. And I would just remind you, we'll look at this in a little bit, but, uh, you know, oftentimes we say these words, you know, uh, the Lord won't put on us more than we can bear. Uh, I don't think that's in the right context. I don't think that's true. I think oftentimes the Lord will put on us more than we can bear so that we will look to Him, so that we will rely upon Him, that we will find that His grace truly is sufficient for our every need. Now, the second truth that uh, Hebrews chapter 4 uh, gives us this morning and uh, the way that God, uh, God's empathy provides comfort for us is that Jesus was tempted in every respect that we are. Now, Hebrews 4 doesn't say that Jesus has suffered in every way that we have, but that he has been tempted in every way. And if suffering is most 
uh, essentially a struggle for faith, and faith is a struggle against the temptation to, str to trust in something else or someone else, that means that Jesus has experienced the crux of every trial that you or I will ever face. Let's say that um, uh, you lose a very important relationship. That relationship crumbles and breaks up. Has Jesus experienced that suffering? No. But what is the sharp edge of that trial? It is your struggle to trust a God who just took away a moment. And in a moment, all that you have hoped for in that relationship. Who just quenched your dreams and your happiness? Now, was Jesus tempted in that way? Most certainly. Just think of what was behind his tears in Gethsemane. So use that to trust his wisdom in your suffering. Does he call you to be abandoned, persecuted, crushed? He has experienced all of that and more. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he knows exactly how it feels. And so in those times of pain and suffering, you know that Jesus understands our weaknesses, and you know that Jesus was tempted in every respect as we are, and yet, the third element to this passage of Scripture, he was without sin. Tempted in every way, and yet without sin. Jesus never gave in. In fact, he's been tempted in every ways that we have never been because temptation ceases the moment that we give in. But Jesus never gave in. I venture no one in this room could say the same, that we've never given in. But with his help, we also can never give in and never, ever give up. We've got a God that we can trust, a God that we can rely upon, a God in which we can come to for, for mercy, a God that we can talk to. I love the fact that we serve a God who is alive, who is a well today, and uh, who's got uh, plenty of time. As a matter of fact, he knows no time. He's an all-knowing God. Uh, he is a God who is ever-present, even in times of trouble. Uh, he is a God that's all-powerful to do uh, whatever uh, he can do uh, and whatever he wants to do in keeping with his good and perfect will. And a God who hears us when we call to him and when we talk with him and pray to him. He is a God that desires to hear from us. Today we celebrate Mother's Day, and I will assure you, just like my mom, uh, who is uh, sitting in an assisted living place, uh, who has lost a lot of her closest friends, whose children are, are mostly away, uh, she is longing for that phone to ring and for her to hear the voice of her children. Not only on Mother's Day, but I believe on any day, at any time. She's always excited and, and uh, welcoming to hear the voice of her children. She loves those times in which we're all together, but those days that we're not together, she longs to hear the voice of her children. She longs to hear the conversation and have conversation with her children. And how much more so does a God in heaven who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son desire to hear from us and so this brings us to the fourth aspect of hebrews chapter 4 let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence with boldness what's the application of these first three truths it's that we can have perseverance in prayer Remember, we looked at this um, a couple of weeks ago in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we are to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep 
powerful words. Remember that the Spirit who is within us as believers in Christ intercedes for you in the, to the same God who suffered for you at the cross. And it is a great comfort to know that we can always approach God in prayer. What's the point of all this? We'll look back at verse 14. In verse 14, we read, Let us hold fast our confession. Suffering is a battle for steadfastness. It's a battle for faith. That's the whole crux of this whole uh, title of this class. And God's empathy towards us in our suffering is comfort that helps us to, to trust. Tim Keller put it well. If we ask God, if we ask God the question, why does God allow evil and suffering to continue? And we look to the cross of Jesus, we still do not know what the answer is. However, we know what the answer isn't. It can't be that He doesn't love us. It can't be that He is indifferent or detached from our condition. God takes our misery and suffering so seriously that He was willing to take it on Himself. So, if we embrace the Christian teaching that Jesus is God and that He went to the cross, then we have deep consolation and strength to face the brutal realities of life on earth. At the cross we see what kind of God we are trusting. We see a God who understands. He is not a God who is cold and, and indifferent and uncaring. A God who has turned His back upon us. A God who has fled uh, from our presence, who, who has written us off. Even when we may have turned our back on Him, even when we have uh, fleeted to trust His love and His will and His purpose for our life. No, in fact, as we have quoted before, Psalm 56, it says that He cares so much that He counts every toss and turn at night and catches every tear in a bottle. Every tear in a bottle. God knows. And aren't you grateful that someday the Scripture says that God Himself, He doesn't assign it to an angel. He doesn't assign it to someone else. The Scripture says in Revelation chapter 21 that God Himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be nothing more to cry about when at last we are face to face with Him. And so we see God who empathizes with us. A God who not only sympathizes with us and, and hurts when we hurt, but a God who empathizes with us. He knows what the hurt is like. And so now we turn our attention to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus suffered as a great example for us. Does anybody have any question at this point? Any comment at this point? If not, then let's uh, look at this example that Jesus gives us. And uh, we go to the passage of Scripture in, in 1 Peter First uh, Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We see that we are a living stone. That we are called to be a holy people. And in verse 20, second part of that, uh, through verse 24, uh, we read this. But if when you do good and suffer, for it you endure, 
This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow his steps. He committed no sin, and neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by your wounds you have been healed. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Jesus is not primarily an example for us to follow. That's what we see in the last verse of this passage. Uh, Christ's death was substitutionary. But it is also an example for us to follow. And in particular, this passage, he is an example in three ways from verse 22 and, and verse uh, 23. Notice, first of all, he committed no sin. He committed no sin. How often are we tempted to sin when we suffer? Your boss unfairly pins a failed project on you. And the next day you see his windows open in the parking lot as it begins to rain. What would it mean to love your enemy? And you're thinking, look, I've taken on this petty Christian way so far. I can just ignore that. But that's not what Jesus did. He, he committed no sin. And notice also, second of all, that no deceit was found in his mouth. Truth-telling is suffering, or in suffering is crucial. Absolutely crucial. We must learn to, to tell the truth about ourselves, about our accusers, and about God. Now, all three of these are hard at times. In suffering, we need to speak the truth about ourselves. If we have sinned and we suffer because of that, we need to admit our own sin. And the fact that at least some of our suffering may be our own fault. And I love the scripture that says that even when we sin, that even if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God is able to take our sin, our, our faults, our, our brokenness, our times in which we have failed in our relationship to Christ, and He is able to put everything back together to make something useful. The story is told years and years ago. Uh, back when churches didn't have a lot of carpet in their buildings, uh, they had those old uh, clay floors. You might remember some of those uh, older church buildings if you grew up in the era in which I did. And uh, there was a little boy in a Sunday school class, and for a Father's Day project, uh, they were making little clay pots. Uh, and they were so proud of uh, this project, and they were excited about it. And so every Sunday after the Bible lesson, uh, they would spend some time uh, working on these clay pots. And uh, they uh, had their Sunday school teacher take those uh, little pots, and they put them in a little kill, and they... Uh, cooked them and got them all good and hard and then the children were painting little designs on there and, and talking about how much they loved their fathers and all this kind of stuff and then the Sunday came, Father's Day and as those uh, parents came to the door uh, one little boy saw his father and he was so excited he picked up his pot and uh, he started uh, going as fast as he could to that door to be able to give that pot that represented his best effort and his love and, uh, and his appreciation for his father. He wanted to give him that pot that he had worked so hard on for so many weeks. And he tripped over his feet and he dropped that pot. And that pot hit that old hard clay floor and broke in several pieces. And all the little boy could do was just get down there and kneel down there on that floor and just 
and just weep and cry. The very thing that he wanted to give to his dad that represented his love was now broken in several pieces. And that very loving father got down next to his son and hugged his son and said, I understand how you feel. And it hurts. And I'm sorry. But son, I tell you what, we can pick up the pieces of this pot and we can put these pieces back together. I'll help you glue them back together. And we can still use this pot. And I will love it even more. Now, we can't do anything to cause God to love us any more or to love us any less. God just loves us completely, totally. But aren't you grateful that even when we have made a mess out of our life, even when we have made choices that just underscore our brokenness, that God comes and he still wraps his loving arms around us and he draws us close to his heart and he says, we will pick up the broken pieces of your life and we can put something very beautiful back together. I'm sure that broken pot of that little boy's, when he looked at it all glued back together, he saw the little cracks, he saw the imperfections, but the one thing that he was always reminded about is that he had a father who absolutely loved him. And so, dear friend, when we've sinned, we don't need to run from God. We don't need to hide from God. We just need to confess our sin and admit where we are at fault. And God is able to cleanse us and able to forgive us and able to put the broken pieces of our life back together and make something very beautiful with it. Second, in suffering, we need to speak the truth about our enemies. When we've been wronged, it's easy to exaggerate, isn't it? We need to understand and speak the truth. It comes at the expense of the truth. When we speak negatively against our enemy, we may feel better for a time, but if it comes at the expense of the truth, all we will have succeeded in doing is distorting the perspective of a person who perhaps could have possibly helped us. And third, we need to speak the truth about God. The Psalms are a wonderful example of what it looks like to, 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 to ask as agonizing questions and yet not to accuse God of evil. ourselves and to others requires self-discipline and, and a good friend to correct us when we've gotten off track. But notice third in this passage of scripture of the example that Jesus gives us in our own suffering, he did not retaliate. Peter says in, in our passage of scripture, he says that uh, he didn't even threaten now, you and I both know that there are perhaps a million little ways in which we can retaliate when we are suffering. A million little ways in which we can punish others. And that we can think we are punishing God. But in suffering, Jesus is our example of one who suffered yet without retaliation. You remember when he was standing before Pilate and falsely accused, he didn't even open up his mouth. Even when he was being crucified and dying on that cross, he looked at his accusers, he looked at those that were gathered around Calvary, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Listen, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. When people have falsely accused me, when people have done wrong against me, I've lived long enough 
And uh, I think I'm mature enough to know, you know, there's going to be a payday someday. There's going to be a day in which God's going to balance the scales. There's going to be a day of accounting. And I'll just leave that up to the Lord. Jesus committed no sin. He had no deceit in his mouth. He never retaliated. That's quite a standard, isn't it? But keep in mind that Jesus' example isn't another law to follow, but it's a indication to do what is best for us. And if you endure suffering as he did, you'll be glad for it. You'll be blessed by it. And Jesus' example points us to freedom and joy. And so just as uh, in our verses from Hebrews, we see that all of this is summed up in faith. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. How do we not sin and suffering? How do we not lie? How do we not stretch the truth? How do we not retaliate? We trust God. We look to him. When we fight with our spouse or a friend, when we've been persecuted for our faith, when someone struggles not to look at pornography or is mourning the loss of a friend or a spouse or a family member. We need to trust that all of this has been carefully measured out by our loving Savior. And for all the things Jesus suffered, we can rejoice in the fact that though he suffered the wrath of God for our sin, we never will. And so here's the conclusion of the matter. Let's put all of this, um, I guess that's uh, outline number four, or number four in your outline. I guess I got a little bit carried away. Um, but uh, how can we possibly do all of this? The example of Jesus, we trust God. We look to God. So here's the conclusion. Let's put all of this, uh, all of these pieces together. Let's say that I'm being slandered by my neighbor, and with that suffering comes a host of temptations, temptations to, to slander back, to defend myself in a sinful way, to be embittered against God for allowing this, uh, just to name three. How does the cross help me here? Well, first, remember that what I need in my temptation is both justice and mercy. Justice for the evil that I am suffering and mercy to help me through it. And just, uh, and Jesus purchased a just God's mercy for me at the cross. Second, we need to remember that Jesus was tempted in every way as I am. He knows exactly what we are going through. And beyond that, he was slandered himself. So return to his word and read through and read about Jesus being slandered. You can read that in Matthew chapter 26. And the picture of all that he went through. Put him in the words of Psalm 7 where David describes the slander that he experienced with words that Jesus later uh, took for himself and reflect on his word for a bit and you will understand Jesus' experience consider how well he understands your present trial and be encouraged in your prayer for deliverance for strength for God's grace to endure a prayer of thanksgiving that God is present with you that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you. A prayer of thanksgiving that there is more to life than what we see in this present generation to what we, than what we are seeing and experiencing at this very moment. Then as you trust in God's providential care, may that increase your love 
and your trust for God. May his peace and his grace give you incredible, incredible assurance that you can endure and that you will get through to the other side. And if you trust that he knows what he's doing, you'll be able to control that inner, uh, perhaps rebellious strength that wants to act out. If you trust that what he is doing is good, you'll speak truth about him and about your own complicity in the matter. And if you trust that your good God is completely in control, then you'll leave vengeance to him and face each day with humility, able to seek the good that God intends for you to do in that particular difficulty rather than being consumed with having to defend yourself or protect yourself or try to get through the difficulty in your own strength and in your own power in your own way. I've lived long enough to know that every miracle of God always begins with a problem and it's a God-sized problem. And So when we look to God, He is able to do the miraculous in our own hearts and in our own lives to do things that we could not do for ourselves that we might live above the level of our circumstances that we might have a greater grace and a greater strength I want to conclude again with something from the uh, book of John Stott's The Cross of Christ and here's one concluding thought we'll pray and we'll be done if I could never believe in God if it were not for the cross in the real world of pain how could one worship a God who was immune to it I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha his legs crossed, his arms folded, his eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face detached from any of the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I have to turn away. And in imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. Nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from a thorn-picked crown, dry mouth and intolerable thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That's the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in light of His. And aren't you grateful for a God who loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son who suffered in our place? so that in Him we might have life, so that in Him we might have life in abundance. And so for the fact, for everyone who would call upon His name, they will be saved. And so if you're watching today and you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today will be the day of salvation. And you'll just simply take all of your brokenness, all of your sorrow, all of your hurt, all of your pain, all of your trials and tribulations, and just lay them at the foot of the cross. But more importantly, I pray that you will lay your life at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, here I am. There's nothing else I can do but just rest in you. And I'm trusting in you and in you alone to be the God 
of my salvation. And dear friend, if you will do that, I'm not saying that the consequences and the problems and the hurts will go away, but I am telling you that there is a God who loves and cares who will come and dwell in you and give you the grace and the strength to be able to endure. And God has something very special for you on the other side where there'll be no more pain, where there'll be no more suffering, where there'll be no more hurt, there'll be no more death. It will be life as God intended it to be. Why not look to him? Why not trust him? Why not live for him today? Father in heaven, how we thank you again for meeting us here in this class together. How we thank you, Lord, for the truths that we have looked at uh, in this hour together. And Lord, as we now go into our worship service, may we go and worship you in spirit and in truth. May we go uh, in your grace to be able to uh, live confidently and boldly in your promises, knowing, Father, that you love us beyond all measure and that you're more than able to do more than we can even ask or even think, even in our time of suffering in the time of our brokenness and pain and sorrow. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you for our risen and living Lord and Savior. And it's in his name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, we're going to go into our time of worship today, and uh, we're going to celebrate uh, Mother's Day, and uh, we're going to see some um, parental dedications. And I know it's going to be a fun day and a great day for us. And so uh, we'll hope to see you in our worship service. Hope to see you here again next week as we uh, continue in week four of our class on fighting for faith in suffering. Have a great week this week. God bless you, and I'll see you next week. God bless.